On this Saturday night, dozens of vulnerable people die in Quebec. It's a dire situation. Now a criminal investigation is being launched into a care home. Canada's political parties come together to keep the paychecks coming. Plus, the grim milestone in the United States, the hotspot for COVID-19, and the greater danger of the new coronavirus in developing nations. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin with a disturbing story out of Quebec. At least 31 residents from a private care home in Montreal have died in the last month. Five were confirmed with COVID-19. Today, Premier Francois Legault ordered a criminal investigation. The owner of this residence refused to give us access to the file of the patients. And it's only last night at 8, 8 p.m. that we learned that the number of deaths since March 13 was 31. The Premier says he believes it's a case of gross negligence. As Dan Spector reports, residents appear to have endured unthinkable conditions in the home. A body is removed from Heron residence in Dorval, Quebec on Saturday, one of more than two dozen people to die inside the private senior's residence since March 13th. No sympathy. Our sympathies. Through tears, the head of the West Island Health Authority gives her condolences to the families who had entrusted the residents to take care of their loved ones as she tried to explain how things went so wrong. They were struggling to keep their ratios of of staff to residents. McVeigh said on March 29th it became clear the situation at Heron was critical. Peter Whelan's mother was among those living in dire conditions. He says one day staff told her they didn't have enough time to change her diaper and clean up her burst urine bag. The, the urine stayed on the floor for another 12 hours at least. Health officials claim their offers to help the residents were met with little collaboration. We had two formal notices, two formal legal notices asking for them to give us information about the residents. The SIU sent people to help on March 29th, including retired nurse Loredana Mole. So we went from room to room and every room then, the stench of urine and feces could have killed a horse. After health officials stepped in, Gail Steinberg says she could not reach her 102-year-old father. I, I can't help but wonder if if the staff has just deserted the place. Her father had been tested for COVID-19. He died on April 6th before the results came back. More important to me today is I would like to know if he was one of those patients who was neglected. The most recent promise they made to us, they broke within an hour. Police officers were outside the residence all day. It's now being investigated for criminal negligence. It's total negligence. Health officials claim things are better now. Authorities promise to call each and every family of deceased residents to give them an explanation. Dan Spector, Global News, Dorval, Quebec. B.C., Alberta and Ontario are also dealing with COVID-19 outbreaks in long-term care homes. Today, the federal government announced it's bringing in new measures to protect care home residents and workers. Morgan Campbell has the latest on those efforts. With more than 100 nursing homes in Ontario reporting cases of COVID-19, government officials are looking to ensure frontline workers have the equipment they need to protect themselves. These are incredibly uh, horrific uh, reports that we've all been seeing. Access to equipment and retraining has been an area of contention. Global News began questioning officials about training after observing healthcare employees wearing PPE outside this Bob Cajun nursing home. Pinecrest Nursing Home is ground zero for a major outbreak that is spread among staff and residents, leaving at least 30 seniors dead. Through its Facebook page, the president of the Ontario Personal Support Workers Association said that her members had training, but went on to raise concerns that the speed at which the virus has hit made it difficult to bring staff up to speed. I don't know of any entity that can have training out that fast when you're dealing with mass hysteria and war zones on the front line. 
The Ontario Chief Medical Officer has stated it's up to each facility to offer proper training. The administrator at Pinecrest Nursing Home says all staff receive this training on how to use the equipment. Our home has been fully stocked with PPE from day one. But Mary Carr did not answer questions from Global News as to why staff or volunteers appeared to wear the equipment outside. Tim Delstra is with UFCW, a union that represents more than two thousand long-term care home employees in Ontario. He says PSWs deserve higher pay, full-time jobs and more supports on the front lines. These are things that we strongly believe that the provincial government could implement quickly and that would be a real benefit. The province's Minister of Health won't commit to higher wages but are looking into creating full-time jobs. That's going to be another key method of keeping COVID-19 out of long-term care homes. But advocates want more done, and they want it done now. They're sitting in their cars before they go into long-term care. They're crying. They're scared to bring it back to their loved ones at home. Morgan Campbell, Global News. The Senate has approved the federal government's emergency wage subsidy bill. It's a $73 billion plan to allow employers impacted by the COVID-19 crisis to keep people on the payroll or rehire those who've been laid off. The Prime Minister says the measure will provide relief in the short term. The government will pay them uh, up to 75% of their, of their salary uh, so that when this is through, uh, Canadians will still have connection to those jobs and our economy can get going again. As Mike LeCouture reports, even though politicians from all political stripes support the subsidy, there are concerns the government's economic boost won't help everyone who needs it. Everybody self-isolating. Hey, how are you doing? Not your typical Saturday sights, but there's nothing typical about a weekend sitting of the House of Commons. And that was underscored in the Prime Minister's speech to Parliament and Canadians in a modern-day call to arms against an invisible enemy. Instead, the front line is everywhere. In our homes, in our hospitals and care centres, in our grocery stores and pharmacies. While asking all Canadians to do their part by staying apart, political parties came together negotiating unanimous consent on the wage subsidy legislation. The measure will see the federal government pay 75% of employees' wages to help keep them on company payrolls. A week ago we said this would take three to six weeks. Obviously now that's two to five weeks. And we're aspiring to do that as rapidly as possible. I'm assured that we will be closer to the short end of that time. A quick turnaround considering this kind of legislation normally takes months to draft, but not quick enough for some business owners. They're, um, they're really worried about the additional two to five weeks before they actually get money in their hands because they are trying as best they can to meet their payroll requirements, but that's becoming increasingly challenging as their income has, trickle, has trickled down to zero. Dan Kelly says with about 80% of small and medium-sized businesses already shut down, this public health crisis is quickly becoming a mental health crisis. It's gotten so bad that we're starting to get calls from business owners that are considering taking their own lives. Now it's why the NDP believes the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit should be paid to every Canadian right now. While the Conservatives are pushing for more oversight of the government while it rushes historic economic measures out the door. We very much believe that in-person accountability sessions in the House of Commons will lead to better results for Canadians. A government House leader, Pablo Rodriguez, says committees are already meeting via teleconference and the Speaker is looking at a virtual version of Parliament. But he points out reopening the Commons would mean support and security staff would also have to come to work. All at a time when they're telling Canadians the best way to fight the pandemic is to stay home. Robin? Mike Lecouture in Ottawa. Thanks, Mike. The economic shock from COVID-19 is huge. Right across Canada, businesses are closed and nobody knows when they'll be back up and running, if at all. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson joins us now. Mercedes, it's very likely that so many businesses won't be able to weather the pandemic storm. Robin, the government's promised aid for businesses is being welcomed, but there's concern it could be coming too late. After complaints from business groups, the government took the time to make some fixes, including making more businesses eligible and lowering the threshold for how much income businesses would have to have lost in order to qualify. 
This week on the West Block, I sat down with Perrin Beatty, who is a former health minister with a head for business as the president and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I asked him how many Canadian businesses will succumb to the economic freeze we're currently in. Nobody can quantify it uh, with any precision, but we're clearly talking about tens of thousands of businesses, uh, many of which have gone dark and won't reopen as a consequence. The average uh, small business has perhaps uh, three weeks of revenues that it can function with cash in the bank to be able to function without more money coming in. We're now into going into uh, the fifth week of lockdown. And we're talking about a program that will take some weeks yet before businesses are able to find the money from that. That means that many of them will simply run out of cash in the meantime, that people, their employees will lose their jobs and the governments will lose the tax revenue and people who've invested all of their savings and, and their dreams in building a business will have lost those as well. And that's why this is a human tragedy on so many different levels. We'll also talk about whether Mr. Beatty thinks there should be a bailout for big oil, how to balance protecting health with a functioning economy and whether it's time to invoke the Emergencies Act. Robin? All right, thanks, Mercedes. And you can watch the West Block tomorrow morning right here on Global. Here's where the number of cases stand in Canada tonight. There are more than 23,000 confirmed cases and more than 650 people have died. Quebec has been hit the hardest, where more than 11,500 people have tested positive and more than 240 people have died in that province. But there is some hope. More than 6,000 Canadians have recovered from the virus. There are growing calls for the federal government to crack down on foreign workers coming from Mexico to begin seasonal farm work without being told to quarantine or being tested for COVID-19 when they arrive. We believe, we affirm clearly that it is the responsibility of the Canadian government when they have somebody released from the airport to make sure that those workers, which once again I welcome, have uh, been through the test and true or required quarantine. About 60,000 foreigners arrive in Canada each year to work on farms. Despite closing the border to international travel, the federal government says these workers can continue to come here, but that farmers are responsible for enforcing strict measures to stop the spread of COVID-19. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says his province is making good progress in the fight against COVID-19. And that means Alberta has an excess of masks, personal protective equipment and ventilators. So he's offering up some of the surplus to help other provinces in need, including Quebec, Ontario and B.C. I, for one, as an Albertan and as a Canadian, could not in conscience watch us stockpile uh, massive amounts of surplus equipment while we see many of our fellow Canadians in some provinces within days of running out of some of these supplies. And Air Canada says it is transforming three of its Boeing 777s so the planes can transport medical supplies across Canada. By removing 422 seats, the company will double its cargo capacity. The first aircraft has hit the skies. The two other planes will be in service within days. Coming up, the COVID-19 crisis gets worse in the United States with a new record. Let's take a look at the global pandemic numbers now. There are more than 1.7 million cases of COVID-19 around the world. The U.S. is reporting more than 20,000 deaths, surpassing Italy as the country with the most fatalities. Today alone, the U.S. recorded more than 1,700 deaths. And in each state, the local governments are struggling with making decisions about schools reopening and church services on this holy weekend. Jennifer Johnson reports. As America becomes the world's greatest victim of COVID-19, government officials continue to plead with citizens to stay home. But on this holy weekend, there's a state-by-state -state debate over allowing people to attend religious services. At least eight states are allowing people to congregate Easter Sunday, including Florida, whose governor continues to preach social distancing. And we said, stay away from crowds, stay home as much as you can, uh, be careful out there. In other states, church parking lots will be patrolled and license plates recorded to enforce 14-day quarantines. But in most cities and towns, pews will be empty. The faithful looking for hope through online services. Be patient. 
endure. The Reverend Timothy Cole will speak to his congregation through video after COVID-19 put him in intensive care for 21 days and forced nearly 400 of his parishioners to self-isolate. If anyone was to come uh, to church um, and get the virus and die, uh, then I think we would all feel really, really uh, terrible. President Donald Trump backed off from his earlier hope of filling up Easter Sunday churches. Now he's focused on slowly reopening businesses and plans to meet with a new task force studying that next week. The World Health Organization and White House coronavirus doctors are warning if lockdown measures are lifted too early, infection rates could soar again. It's his choice, but I certainly will continue, as I've always had, to give my honest assessment of the scientific and data that is really the evidence that I base my judgments on. But local leaders are really in control of what will reopen and what will stay closed. New York City's mayor has decided to suspend the rest of the school year at America's largest district. It's literally a painful decision to close our schools because we feared at that moment that we would not be able to bring them back. Schools are expected to reopen in September. Lawmakers and educators have learned their lesson on just how dangerous COVID-19 can be. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Still ahead, the hard lessons Canadians are learning about savings with the COVID crisis. It's an incredibly stressful time for so many Canadians who have found themselves out of work or without a paycheck. Financial advisors generally encourage people to save three to six months of their salary in an emergency fund. But as David Aiken reports, that's not how most Canadians live. For most of the last decade, Canadians spent what they earned. New TVs, new cars, new homes. And if Canadians' earnings were not enough, Canadians borrowed. And why not? Interest rates have been stuck at generational lows. Job growth had been strong, so strong that unemployment has also touched generational lows. The COVID-19 crisis turned all of that upside down. Uh, the issue for a lot of Canadians is that they have no savings. Uh, they live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they might have a bit of money in the account that'll get them to the end of the month. Uh, but if they're off work for a month or two, they're in serious financial difficulty. And that has put into stark relief another number that has hovered near generational lows, the national household savings rate. For the last decade, Canadians have barely saved three and a half cents of every dollar of disposable income, three and a half cents to the dollar. The end result, just one in every three Canadians or 31 percent say they have less than a week of savings or no savings at all to rely on. That's according to a poll by Ipsos, provided exclusively to Global News. Just under one in four, or 23 percent, have two to four weeks of savings, while another one in five, or 20 percent, say they have between five and 13 weeks of savings to draw on. That partly explains why the federal government focus has been on replacing income rather than protecting savings. Income was all most Canadians had. Most of the folks that are going to be laid off uh, are not making $100,000 a year or $150,000 a year and have a big savings account. Most of them are making $12, $14, $15 an hour. They have no savings. Uh, they live paycheck to paycheck. The great irony is that Canadians cannot now afford to be a nation of savers. Canadians have to be a nation of spenders. Canadians need to spend on a meal at a local restaurant, some new clothing at a favorite retailer, spend on a new home and all the furnishings in it. For a quick and speedy recovery, Canadians have to spend and not save. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. As we keep you informed on COVID-19, Donna Friesen will be hosting a special program on Sunday evenings. It's called Coronavirus, The New Reality, and it starts tomorrow at 7 p.m. Up next, the devastation facing developing nations as they prepare for the pandemic. Most developing nations are already in crisis with weak economies, fragile health care systems and food scarcity. As Redmond Shannon reports, COVID-19 will likely cause even more death and destruction in this part of the world. In developing nations like Uganda, COVID-19 threatens to be even more devastating than it has been in Italy, Spain or New York. Weak healthcare systems, poor sanitation and cramped living conditions could all contribute to a higher death toll. 
And with much of the planet on lockdown, these nations don't have the financial resources to support those unable to work. The UN says more than half of the world has no access to income support. We have no food, we have no money. I think everybody has to pray. I'd rather die from disease than from hunger, says this man in India's capital, New Delhi, articulating the brutal choice that so many are facing. The World Food Programme says the crisis will likely worsen the situation in Africa's Sahel region. Drought and violence there have already put millions more at risk of hunger this year. So our major challenge now, all the all the area all the routes are blocked and there's the access are really limited and and we are trying to prepare ourselves to help uh, to avoid the corona spread for medics preparing for covid-19 the challenges and dangers are even greater than in the west we cannot fight a battle when we do not have ammo we need to put dr mamadou balde works in an infectious disease unit in sierra leone he says even in normal circumstances, basic equipment is in short supply. The country has just a handful of ventilators. However, Sierra Leone does have the advantage of lessons learned from the 2014 Ebola outbreak. So Ebola is in a position where communication is easy. Ebola and COVID are quite different. But as long as you say there is an outbreak of a particular disease and you have to involve certain measures, people are already prepared. But many developing countries do not have that traumatic memory. And as the virus takes hold, the only warnings they have are the grim stories currently unfolding in the West. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. And that's Global National for this Saturday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight we leave you with an Olympian effort to help healthcare workers. The Premier of Ontario, hey, Ryan. Premier Doug Ford. Thanks, sir. Hockey player turned medical student Haley Wickenheiser scored this FaceTime with actor Ryan Reynolds as he and Ontario Premier Doug Ford assisted her PPE drive in Toronto. Volunteers used hockey sticks to support distancing measures as they collected thousands of supplies for frontline workers. Another sign of communities coming together. Good night.